Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhu Peng An. Today, I would like to talk about uh, another important topic uh, using LangChain uh, to create retrieval augmented generation system or rack system. Uh, in particular, I'm going to discuss how uh, you can use LangChain to index uh, your uh, text data and put them into a vector storage. Um, again, uh, I'm using materials from the textbook. Um, uh, the name of the textbook uh, is Learning uh, Lanchen, uh, and uh, the book is available uh, for preview uh, in uh, O'Reilly uh, Media. So if you are interested in that, uh, you can uh, register an account in O'Reilly media and uh, read the book yourself. Uh, I have adapted some of the contents from the textbook uh, for the demonstration purposes. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first, uh, if you want to run the program, uh, I in the show notes, I show you where I uh, uh, upload the IP1B file, the Jupyter Notebook file, to uh, my GitHub repo, so you can find the code there. And uh, uh, you will need to uh, to download and install the PYPDF, which is a module to, uh, 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 to allow you to uh, read a PDF file. And also uh, the FAISS of face uh, CPU, which allow you to um, to uh, execute uh, a vector store uh, using CPU. So if you have GPU, you can also use the uh, the fast uh, uh, GPU as well. So fast is a local vector storage uh, platform developed by Meta. Okay. And now uh, here we just import a number of modules. Uh, the OS and .env is going to help you uh, load your OpenAI API uh, because we are using the GPT models. You need to have access to the OpenAI API in order to access those models. And I also import a number of Lantern modules, uh, such as Lantern OpenAI, Lantern Community, Lantern Core, and also the Lantern Text Splitter. We are going to demonstrate how to use those functions for the modules um, in a second. Okay. So when you import those modules, you're ready to go. Uh, first, let me show you a variety of ways that you can load your files. Loading files depending upon the, uh, the the format of the file, whether it is a TXT file or, you know, say an HTML uh, web page or a PDF file uh, or a doc file, uh, you need to use you no know, different loaders uh, to load those files correctly. And let me first show you how to load a TXT file. Uh, so now I'm using. Um, Lightning AI Studio. Uh, uh, this is a online platform allow you to run VS Code like environment, virtual environment online, and uh, you no, know, it is free of charge. Uh, I find this very useful. So if you um, you don't want to configure your uh, virtual environment in your local VS Code, uh, you're welcome to use apply. A register uh, and then use the uh, Lightning uh, AI Studio. So here um, I've already uploaded my TXT file. It's called Teaching with Generative AI TXT uh, into my uh, Lightning Studio. Uh, if you want to take a look, is the file is here, um, and it's fairly small file, uh, basically containing. Uh, an article about how to teach uh, with generative AI. Uh, so the contents is, is not important. I just want to use this as a demonstration. So we have the TFT file in the folder this studio. 
and um, now I just going to provide the uh, path to that file, and I'm going to use the txt uh, the text loader, which is a function provided by Lantern community to load the file. So I define the loader, and then I just use loader load to load the file. And then you see that uh, the loader.load is going to create a document. Uh, and a document contains some metadata, uh, such as source, uh, which is where the data uh, is stored. Uh, plus, really important is the page content. So in this tab, uh, you have the content uh, from this TXT file. So the loader.load is going to create a, uh, a JSON file containing uh, and the, the metadata as well as the page content. Right? Uh, now let's show you how you can load a web page uh, with T uh, HTML content. So here I'm using uh, this web page uh, is the, uh, the ai.google uh, slash discover slash blocks. So uh, if you do that, it's going to directly load uh, uh, using the web-based loader to load a HTML file. As you can see here, this is the metadata, and also uh, besides that, this is the uh, uh, the content. Okay. Um, okay. And now uh, let me show you how to load the PDF file. Uh, so you need to use the PY PDF loader and making sure that you have your uh, PY PDF module uh, installed. Otherwise, uh, you won't be able to use the PY PDF loader. Right? And I already have a uh, PDF file called fallconference.pdf uh, in my this studio um, uh, folder. So uh, the display is not very good because I haven't installed the display um, function for uh, the PDF, uh, but it is indeed a PDF file. So uh, I can load here and then I'll uh, save, save the, uh, the, the, uh, the document in the so-called pages uh, uh, variable. Okay, so that's done. And now, uh, Let's see how we can split the files into chunks. The reason why we need to do that is uh, although the large language model uh, you know, can process large amount of data, but still uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the processing, the window size of the large language model is limited. So therefore, uh, we uh, uh, usually need to split a larger file into many chunks. So each chunk has a fixed size, for example, a, a thousand characters you know, or you know, 500 characters. Um, so that is easier for the large language model to consume um, uh, batch by batch. And uh, also uh, when we create a vector database, uh, we want to save those chunks individually uh, in the vector database. So each chunk uh, is going to be embedded um, and then uh, with a specific document uh, chunk number. Uh, so for example, if you have six chunks, uh, if you have a file split into six chunks and each chunk is going to be embedded and save and indexed uh, in uh, the vector database. Uh, so then you will have uh, six uh, indexes from zero to five uh, indicating each chunk. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's see how we can split the document into chunks. Uh, still I'm using the uh, text loader uh, as example. So I define the loader and then I uh, load the document into the variable docs. And now I'm calling a very useful function called recursive character text splitter, uh, which is going to uh, you know, be able to go over uh, the docs and uh, uh, chunk it um, uh, to a specified size uh, and then uh, return the, the, the chunks uh, in, a, a, in a list. So here I first define the splitter. I want the chunk size to be a thousand character. 
Um, and also I want some over overlap between the chunks. So specifically, I want 200 uh, character to be overlap between you no know, uh, uh, you no know, any two chunks uh, that are adjacent to each other. So um, no, there's really no optimal chunk size. And sometimes, you know, for uh, for your specific purposes, for example, when you search uh, the vector database for answer, uh, you no, know, you you may need to uh, play around with this chunk size to see what is the optimal. But usually, I would say five hundred to a thousand uh, is the commonly used chunk size. And also, there's no optimal uh, overlapping. Uh, so overlap just means that uh, if you have two chunks, two agent, uh, two adjacent chunks, the uh, uh, the second uh, chunk is going to have up to two hundred character uh, that uh, come from the 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 tail of the first chunk. Um, so uh, the reason is that sometimes uh, the answer may uh, may not be uh, included in a single chunk, but may in between of two chunks. If that's the case, and the chunks have no overlapping, it would be difficult for uh, the rack pipeline to identify that answer. So that is the primary reason why you want to have some overlapping, but not too substantial. Usually, about you will see about a uh, hundred to two hundred uh, chunk overlap, okay. and also the recursive character tax splitter is going to comply with uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, uh, the vocabulary uh, and the sentence boundary. So it's not going to split in between uh, of a um, uh, of a word and split that word uh, into two subwords. Okay, so you're going to uh, usually uh, comply with the sentence and a vocabulary boundary. Uh, okay, so we are going to use the splitters to split the document. Uh, I use the split document function and just need to provide the docs variable. And then we can take a look of the splitted documents to see how many chunks we have created uh, out of the splitted documents. And we are also take a look of the first splitted document, the second and third, so those three chunks. So let's do that. We will see that uh, the TXT file has been split into six chunks. Um, and uh, this is the uh, first chunk. Uh, it's just including the title, Teaching with Generative AI. And the second chunk is Student Faculty Report Growing Use of Generative AI Tools that Produce Human Like Writing, et cetera. Um, um, and then uh, all the way to here, however created. And then if you take a look at the third chunk, the third chunk actually uh, repeat uh, the tail of the second chunk. So the second chunk is from uh, here. When the student uses this tool, they should acknowledge that use, uh, uh, acknowledge that use. Uh, and then here it repeats. When the student uses this tool, they should acknowledge the use. The student is responsible for the content and accuracy of any work, uh, of any work they submit. Uh, however created, right? So this is the overlapping part we talk about um, uh, between the two adjacent chunks, okay? Okay, so not only the recursive character text splitter can split uh, text, it can also split uh, specific uh, languages, uh, for example, computer language. So that show me, uh, that, let me show you this capacity. So I create some Python code. Uh, it's a very simple Python code uh, in which I have a comment, define a function to calculate the sum, product, and difference of two numbers. And then I define this function. In this function, I also have some uh, comments. And then I uh, uh, invoke this function and I print the results. And this time I'm going to specify uh, the recursive character text splitter uh, using dot from language. Here I can specify uh, basically telling uh, the splitter what language uh, uh, the targeted document contain so that it can use the specific text splitter uh, to deal with that language. 
So here I specify language. Uh, the language uh, is dot Python. So this is Python language. And then I'm going to chunk it using much smaller chunk size uh, because this computer code rather than you no know, free text. And uh, I did not specify the overlap yet. Uh, so if we do this, uh, because this is this Python code is just a string variable, it's not a document. Um, uh, so therefore, I, uh, instead of calling split document, I call create documents uh, from the Python splitter, and then I include that into a list. Uh, so uh, because the create documents accept a list of strings, right? but now, of course, we only have a single string. Okay, so when we apply that, uh, you can also take a look of the first, second, and third chunks to see whether it uh, it is what you expect. Uh, so the first is the including the comment. Uh, the second is also comment, and the third is the uh, the the, uh, the the first uh, row of uh, of the Python code itself, right? And uh, you can also do the same uh, for say markdown file. So here I create a markdown file, very simple markdown file. And uh, I tell the recursive character text splitter that I'm using markdown language. Um, and then uh, I uh, specify create a document. I provide the markdown text in the list. And uh, optionally, you can also provide your metadata. So here I provide metadata uh, source uh, coming from this website. This is all you no know, hypothetical. And then uh, when you split that, um, so you are going to have you no know, uh, three. I show you the three uh, for three chunks. And also you can you know, get your metadata uh, by using dot metadata. So metadata I basically show uh, the dictionary uh, for the, the the key variable pair key is source and uh, the the the, uh, the value is the uh, website address. Okay, so uh, we've talked about how to split your document into chunks, and now we can start creating embeddings for your document. So embeddings basically means that you you're going to convert uh, your no chunk of text into chunks of floating numbers. Okay, so um, the uh, the reason why you want to uh, create uh, floating numbers out of the chunk of text is because you want later on to feed that into uh, the large language model. Um, for uh, and first, you no, know, put them into a vector database uh, and then feed them into large language model. Um, and uh, 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 because the large language model, uh, they, they uh, consume uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the numerical values. Um, and then, uh, so if the user uh, asks a query, uh, the query is going to be embedded, basically converting into flow number as well. And then uh, we can do some easy comparisons, for example, calculating the similarity uh, using cosine similarity score uh, or no other um, uh, 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 other matters of the similarity uh, between two uh, two list of floating numbers and then being able to identify uh, the chunk that is most relevant. Uh, to the user query. Okay? So for that purposes, for both the large language model and also for computing similarity between the query and the chunk, uh, you will need to uh, embed uh, your, uh, your chunks of text. Okay? So and how to do that? Well, uh, you can use, there are many embeddings available. So embedding uh, are usually um, go with the model. Okay, so different models use different embeddings. Uh, so therefore, in this case, uh, because we are going to use uh, the GPT models from OpenAI, uh, so uh, we will use the OpenAI embeddings. Okay, so here I first initiate the OpenAI embedding model. 
Uh, and this embedding model is going to uh, uh, create the, um, uh, 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 we will have uh, a, a dimension of uh, 1,566. So for, for every single uh, uh, document uh, is going to use 1,536 1, floating number to represent that, that particular document. Okay. So that is the open AI embedding. Uh, and uh, you can use other embeddings if you like, uh, but here uh, we are going to stick with the open AI embedding. And I'm going to embed a list of strings, uh, for example. So here I first uh, 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 provide uh, five very simple chunks of text. The first chunk is good morning. The second chunk is I love you. The third chunk is thank you. The fourth chunk is bye. And the fifth chunk is you are welcome. Uh, and then I'm going to show uh, use the embed uh, underscore documents to embed uh, the um, uh, there's five chunks, okay. And after that, I'm going to print the embedding for you to take a look, and uh, I'll also show the shape of the embedding. So because we have five chunks, and each chunk is represented by uh, you no know, one uh, uh, one thousand five hundred thirty six uh, floating numbers. So the embedding shape should be five uh, in the first dimension and 1,536 in the second dimension. So let's take a look. Uh, the embeddings, as you see here, this is a list of lists. And each list, uh, we have uh, five lists in total. And for each list, though, they are represented by 1,536 uh, floating numbers. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, the... Uh, uh, the, you see the embedding shape. Uh, there are five in the first dimension. The five you could consider as the five chunks, or the, you can consider that as a batch size. And then uh, for each uh, em embedding, you have five one thousand five hundred thirty six dimensions. Okay, so that is embedding. And now let's provide you a complete example of embedding a document uh, from file loading all the way to chunking and embedding. So here we load a document, we load a TXT document, and then we split the documents uh, into chunks. Uh, and then you can uh, you can generate uh, uh, embeddings. Okay, uh, and finally um, you can. Uh, embed documents. Uh, here uh, you use embed model, embed documents, and uh, uh, you are going to pre you, you are going to create a list of all the chunks. So I'm using this uh, list comprehension uh, to create uh, to provide uh, the page content for each chunk uh, in the in the uh, in the chunks uh, document. Uh, so uh, let's implement this, and you see that uh, now we have uh, uh, embedding save six because uh, we, we have chunked this uh, TXT file into six chunks, and uh, each chunk has a dimension of 1,536. 1, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, if you want to, and then we need to save and store the embeddings in a vector store. Okay, so vector store or called a vector database or called sometimes called a vector index uh, is a way that we can uh, efficiently save those uh, embeddings, embedded documents um, into a numerical database uh, for, uh, for uh, the query purposes. Okay. And uh, uh, how to embed, uh, how, how to index uh, the uh, embeddings to build a vector database. There are many uh, free local vector databases uh, and commercial online vector stores available. Uh, the popular uh, paid version, cloud uh, version of vector stores, for example, include uh, PyCon, uh, MongoDB, uh, etc. 
and they are uh, suitable for large scale uh, vector storage, uh, such as you no know, millions or even billions of rows of data. Okay. Uh, but usually, if you have uh, you know, a, a moderate or small uh, embeddings to, to store, then uh, you can use some local storage, uh, for example, Chroma uh, or uh, uh, Face. Uh, or the uh, uh, other, uh, there are many uh, local vector databases as well. So here I'm going to use the face FASS, uh, which is a local storage for small or moderate uh, uh, database. And uh, I'm going to use face uh, from documents and uh, for the documents, I just uh, provide the chunks and then you just need to provide the embedding model. Okay. Uh, so make sure that if you use the uh, face to build a vector database, uh, you need to remember uh, you need to install uh, the 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 face uh, CPU or face GPU, uh, and uh, let's create this vector DB vector database. Okay, it's done because uh, uh, we we have a very small document, uh, a very small number of chunks. And now, uh, after you build this vector database, uh, you can start you know, uh, doing a query, right? Uh, because uh, underlying, uh, when you do a query, um, the, uh, the vector database is going to do a similarity search, uh, searching, you no know, first embedding your query into, um, uh, in, uh, and embed your, your query uh, into the same dimension, uh, 1,536 dimensions um, as a floating numbers, a list of floating numbers, and then it's going to uh, calculate the cosine similarity between your query and any of the six chunks uh, saved in the storage uh, to see which document or documents have the highest, highest score uh, for the similarity. Um, and then it's going to return those documents to you. Okay. So here I'm going to demonstrate how you can use similarity search to find similar documents to a query. Uh, I use the similarity search function uh, provided by face. And then I just need to provide the query. Uh, the query is how does a professor assess the appropriateness of a student's work? And you can optionally uh, provide how many document uh, you are going to allow the vector database to return to you. Um, I think the default could be four or five. Uh, I don't recall, but here I specify it goes two. So I'm going to only going to return two most similar documents uh, from the vector database. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, if I do this, I'll print the first two documents. Um, uh, so those are the two documents returned. Uh, this doc, the first document is the external patterns. Writing does not match a student's previous work. Blah blah blah. Uh, it is seems to be related to the question. Uh, and this is the second doc chunk uh, returned. Detecting and uh, um, uh, blah blah blah. So this is the the second. So both seems to be related to the question. Okay. So notice that those two documents are unaltered. They are the original documents uh, that's retrieved uh, from the data database, okay, with no uh, with, with, with no augmentation. So later on, we are going to in the in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how you can uh, use large language model to further process the written documents so that it can provide a more tailored answer to the user's query. Okay, so uh, when the database, the vector database is built, uh, you can you can change it, you can revise it, you can add to it, you can delete uh, some of the uh, of the chunks. Um, so it's very flexible. Uh, so here I just showcase how you can add more documents to the vector database. So here I create, uh, I have an additional three document. Okay. Uh, so in this document, document one, I provide some page content. I have chocolate chip pancakes and scrambled eggs for breakfast this morning, and I provide some metadata. 
And then I provide the second document, the weather forecast for tomorrow is cloudy and overcast with a high of 62 degrees. And the third document, building an exciting new project with Landchain, come check it out. Um, and I create those three documents manually. Uh, and also I add the documents into a list. And then you know, I can create a unique identifier uh, for, uh, for each document. Okay. Uh, so here I create a unique ID uh, uh, for each uh, of the, the three documents. And then uh, I can add the documents to the vector database. I just need to use the function uh, add documents. I provide the documents. I also provide the IDs making sure that IDs are unique. Otherwise, uh, it may uh, confuse the vector database. Remember the vector database by default have IDs starting from zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, uh, five. And because now I create some unique IDs using the UUID4 uh, uh, function. So therefore uh, we can make sure that the IDs uh, do not duplicate with existing IDs in the vector database. Okay. Uh, so if I do that, now I have added uh, those three documents into my existing vector store. Uh, the vector store previous have six documents and now it should have nine in total. Right? Uh, now let's take a look. Uh, I create a new similarity search. This time I ask how is the weather tomorrow? Okay? Notice that in the previous documents, uh, uh, the, the chunks that we created using the txt file, there's nothing about weather, right? So, uh, but in the new documents I provide, there's one uh, element that relates to the weather. So here, the weather forecast for tomorrow is cloudy and overcast uh, with a high of 62 degrees. So therefore, it should return that document to me. Okay, so let's see whether that is the case. And indeed, it returned it to me uh, of that particular chunk, uh, which is most recently added to the vector database. So that's all we want to talk about today. And you can check my next lecture on how to create uh, rack pipelines using Lanchin. Thank you for watching.